Hi everyone, good evening. Uh, welcome to SEP Foundation Programs Lecture Series, Perspectives and Introduction to the Arts and Social Sciences. Uh, please note you can keep your video on if you want, you can keep your cameras on. Uh, okay, so for the second lecture in this series, we have with us Anirudh Kanyapati. Anirudh is a researcher and writer. He's the host of Echoes of India and Yud. Uh, they're absolutely brilliant podcasts on Indian history, so do go and listen to them. They're great fun. Uh, his work covers a variety of areas from history to technology to geopolitics. Um, in September 2020, he won the New Indian Express 40 Under 40 Award for his work as a public historian. Uh, currently, he's working on a book on the medieval Deccan, and that is also what he's going to talk about today. Uh, Anirudh, hi, welcome to CFP. It's uh, great to have you here. Uh, Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you. So, okay, so we're ready for this mad ride to medieval India, and I'm not going to keep everyone waiting any longer. So, Anirudh, please take over. Awesome. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. Yes. Okay, amazing. Um, all right, so on that note, um, thank you so much, Diana. Uh, thank you for asking me to be here today evening. And thank you, all of you. Uh, I'm sure you've been having like a whole bunch of online classes through this week. So thank you so much for showing up uh, for this lecture today. Um, as Diana said, what I'm going to be talking about today is the mad world of medieval India. And I'm probably going to be telling you about um, what kind of evidence survives from the period? How do we really tell historical stories with the evidence that we have? Um, and the really amazing stories that this evidence actually tells us about what went down in India over a thousand years ago. Um, let me begin by um, showing you all an image um, of what is apparently a goddess. Uh, you can see in one hand, she's holding a snake. In one hand, she's holding a drum. Uh, in another, she's got a bell. And finally, she's got a spear of some sort. Um, and she's just sitting there with two attendants around her. Um, does anybody have any idea, maybe looking at the style, the kind of faces that you see her, um, the stone perhaps, does anybody have any idea where on earth this goddess might be found today? Southern India. Okay. Any any uh, any other ideas? Around Madhya Pradesh. Madhya Pradesh. Okay. Any other ideas? Looking at the sphere, it seems it should be East India or somewhere. East India. Bihar. Okay. I, we're getting warmer. Bihar. Bihar. Um, okay. Not not quite there yet. Um, any other ideas? Orissa. West Bengal. Tamil Nadu. Kolkata. Broadly, almost there. All right. So I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to end the suspense and tell you. Um, the ones who are closer to the East Coast are kind of right. Uh, but I was thinking uh, something way further east. This goddess is actually to be found in China, uh, particularly in the port of uh, Guangdong, uh, famously known as Canton. Um, and and really, what what are, one of the stories I'm going to try and tell you today is how on earth this goddess ended up in China of all places, right? Um, because if you think about it. Um, in, in this grand stage of history that I'm showing you here, um, South Asia, India is really in the center. And as a lot of people are saying, this, this looks kind of like a South Indian, East Indian goddess, right? So she probably, the idea of making this goddess probably comes from somebody who's living here, but somehow this goddess is to be found there uh, in East Asia of all places. And the stone that was used to make her was actually from the hills near Guangdong. If you look at uh, the imagery on her face uh, and probably the features, uh, they don't exactly seem totally Indian. And in the iconography seems a lot simpler than what you might actually find in a South Indian temple. Um, so evidently the people who are making it were local sculptors. So how is it that somebody who's sitting in Guangdong um, is commissioning an image of an Indian goddess? Why would they commission that? Um, why would they use the particular style that that goddess uses? Um, who are the people who are actually trained sitting in China who are somehow qualified to sit and make that? And how were they paid for? How, what, what do the Chinese think of them? There's all these stories that pop up when you look at an interesting artifact like this. Um, and I'm sure you might get a sense just by looking at it um, that clearly the medieval world as we know it uh, is far more interconnected than we think because it's not just one person who's sitting in Guangdong saying, hey, I, I want to see a picture of this goddess. It's hundreds, uh, perhaps thousands of people who are part of a much, much larger system who are allowing the creation of images like this. And this is just one thing that they left behind. We can imagine that there must be many, 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 many other things from all across the world that kind of show us these interesting examples of connections. 
Um, so let's try to figure out how we can answer this puzzle, right? So um, what are the what are the things that really remain from the medieval period? When I say medieval, I'm talking roughly 700 to 1200 AD. Um, so what really survives from this long ago? As you can imagine, it's not really a lot. Um, we have mostly texts, so you have stuff that are like inscriptions, for example, that that have survived on temples, um, or perhaps uh, palm leaf manuscripts that were that have been painted, um, perhaps in a monastery in Odisha or or in Gujarat or something. Um, we have relics. Uh, we have a whole bunch of temples that still survive from this period. Um, um, all of these are in various states of preservation. Some of them are still worshipped at today. A lot of them are still being excavated. Um, and of course, we have archaeological work. Um, some of the famous ports of medieval India have kind of been dug up and we find stuff like pottery or coins. And that kind of tells us a little bit about the movement of people. Um, but all of these, as you can imagine, aren't really uh, a definitive uh, cross section of everything that really happened back then, right? Um, imagine if somebody a thousand years from now um, were to find a bunch of ads printed by the government in newspapers and try to make history out of that. It wouldn't really be a very good history, would it? So um, this image that you see here, this pyramid, uh, kind of tells you where the evidence that we have from medieval India really comes from. Um, and as you can see, most of it actually uh, was made by super, super rich people. Um, to be literate in medieval India, you had to be uh, you had to be born into the upper classes. Um, to be important enough to actually build a temple, which meant hiring hundreds, perhaps thousands of people, you had to be the equivalent of the Mukesh Ambani of the times. Um, and even if you were to leave an archaeological trace, if you owned, for example, a gold cup or something, or or a bit of jewelry, um, or even a really nice comb. You had to be pretty rich, um, considering that most people in medieval India were just farmers living at a barely subsistence, subsistence level. The vast majority of medieval Indians, perhaps 90, 95% of them, had left absolutely no trace. And we have no idea, uh, for example, who the sculptors were, who were the people who carved that beautiful uh, goddess in China? What, what did, who were they married to? Were they Chinese or were they Indians? What language did they speak? We have absolutely no idea about any of that. Um, so that brings me to what I think is by far the most powerful tool when it comes to telling stories about medieval India. And that is the idea of comparison. Um, and when I say comparison, I don't just mean comparing medieval India to other medieval societies, but also to modern India as well. And trying to see what we can see about the present that's reflected in the past and vice versa. Um, so you see, I've put like a whole bunch of pyramids uh, all across this entire world map here. Um, and that line that you see on each pyramid represents um, how much of each society has kind of left a trace that survives till today. Um, as you can imagine in mainland Europe, we actually know an insane amount of detail about the lives of the ordinary people, not just about things. Um, I had a friend, for example, who studied in the UK uh, and wrote a dissertation about um, the financial situation of single women in 11th century Europe. Like, can you imagine somebody writing a document like that about medieval India? We simply don't have the evidence, or perhaps the evidence is out there and we haven't really found it. Um, so you can see that the central pyramid that I've created uh, on South Asia shows the line only at the very, very top. Uh, that's to indicate that most of the stuff that we're familiar with from medieval India, all the inscriptions and temples I was telling you about, were only left by the super rich. Um, whereas in other parts of the world, we know a little more about what the rest of society was up to. Um, and what does that tell us? What, is, what do we learn from the other parts of the world? Um, what we see over this period, uh, roughly 500 years from 700 to 1200, um, is that there are denser and denser interactions between all these geopolitical regions, by which I mean to say that they're trading more, they're exchanging, um, they're exchanging much more volumes of goods, people and ideas are moving at them at a constantly increasing rate. Um, we also see in a lot of these places that um, social complexity is accelerating, by which I mean um, that agricultural technology is growing more efficient. So that means the population is growing. Um, and because the population is growing, cities are starting to grow. And as cities grow, um, we start to see more and more kind of economic roles emerging. Um, so if you remember what I was saying a little earlier about, about you know, kings and architects and you know, the rest of the people just being farmers, um, in the rest of the world, we're seeing, yes, most people are still farmers. But there's a whole bunch of new jobs that are being created. Um, so you have aristocrats, you have landlords, you have priests, you have uh, architects, you have um, you have people who are sitting and are making textiles, for example. You have bureaucrats, you have military men, um, and the economy is going constantly, constantly more complex and is increasing, increasingly interacting with more and more parts of the world. And as a result, creativity is more of a thing. Art is more of a thing. You see this explosion of really beautiful stuff. 
Um, the image in the center, for example, is a mosaic uh, made by the Byzantines um, who lived in modern day Turkey. Um, and it's a really beautiful example of their art. And it's just one among many, many thousands of examples of their art that you could survive. And you really have to think about what were the myths and the legends that um, they were trying to communicate to the people that saw them. And that gives you a glimpse of a much, much more complex and dynamic and colorful society uh, than we might otherwise think existed in the past. So um, now that I've said all this, uh, let me tell you a little bit about what I've learned uh, about the Deccan by applying all these methods. Um, so my story starts roughly in the sixth century or so. Um, you guys might have heard of the Gupta Empire um, in your school textbook. So this is set just after the fall of the Gupta Empire. And what you see um, in the map on the left is that a whole bunch of new power centers are starting to emerge. Um, now ignore everything that's happening in North India when you look at uh, this particular blob um, in Karnataka. Um, here, um, it was a very dry kind of land. So um, most of what was happening was this kind of pastoralist um, and like shifting agriculture. Um, and water was a very, very scarce resource. So people are constantly fighting over tiny sources of water. Um, this image that you see in the center is an indication of what these warriors might have looked like uh, with these beautiful kind of uh, hooked, uh, almost like butcher's knives um, and these thick shields that they were using. Um, and what we see sometime around the sixth century is that one particular group of guys um, who seem to have been of like a, uh, just, just generally a low agricultural kind of origin, somehow become important enough that they start to call themselves Maharaja or great king. Um, and they perform a big sacrifice and they build temples. And um, this image that you see is from one of their earliest ones. And it shows you this umbrella and two fans made of yak tails um, called chauris. Uh, and these are symbols of royal power. It's only kings in medieval India that ever dared to use this umbrella and those fans. Um, so clearly by the sixth century or so, you see the emergence of a kingdom. So we know what is happening at the very top of that pyramid, a kingdom is emerging. Um, and what do these guys do? As soon as they come to power, uh, just like any good political party does, uh, the Chalukyas uh, begin to issue a whole bunch of advertisements. Um, now we might not think of uh, temple architecture and temple sculpture that you see here as advertisements, um, but that's basically what they are. Um, even though now we see them as purely religious things, uh, for the Chalukyas especially, um, it was very clear to them that the king was meant to be identified with some of the sculptors that you see in their temples. Um, so what the Chalukyas called themselves, aside from Maharaja, was this very interesting title called uh, Sri Prativi Vallabha. Um, and what Sri Prativi Vallabha means um, is fortune's favorite and earth's beloved. Um, a uh, that's something that we might think of as being applied to Vishnu, who is the husband of uh, Lakshmi and Bhudevi. Uh, but the Chalukyas, by claiming this title, are trying to say that, look, we are basically Vishnu on earth. We are the beloveds of the goddess of fortune and the goddess of earth. And we can do whatever we damn well please with the earth. And you guys had better not question us. Um, and I find that to be just so interesting uh, because in more recent Indian history, we're more used to seeing kings directly, right? So um, if you look at the painting that I've kept here, uh, this is a really famous painting of Jahangir, the Mughal emperor. And it's something I really like because um, it gives you, it is very obviously a propaganda tool. It shows him standing on the earth, uh, wearing these beautiful, pretty little slippers um, and shooting one of his enemies in the head, a chap called um, Malik Umbar, uh, who is a Deccani chap. Um, and interestingly, Jahangir never actually managed to defeat Malik Umbar. But this portrait is trying to say, look at me, I'm, I'm strong and I'm super powerful. Um, and there's also so many interesting things happening in this image. You can see these little angels that are there, which aren't really an element of Indian iconography. So he's taken them from European iconography and he's created this image of himself to say, look, I'm so cool. I'm super modern. I'm super, super globalized. And look, here I am defeating my enemy. Um, and this is very interesting to me because you kind of see that reflected today um, in advertising for movies. Uh, so this is a poster um, from the movie Bahubali, which some of you might have seen. And I just find it interesting for so many reasons. Um, the first is aesthetically, just in terms of the way that our protagonist looks. Um, he doesn't look anything like what a medieval Indian king might have portrayed himself as. Um, medieval Indian kings were, took uh, quite a lot of pride in having a bit of a paunch, as you can see from that, from that portrait of Jahangir. Uh, but our man here has eight pack abs and he's super proud of it. And he's uh, really deliberately leaning almost into a Western aesthetic, a Western indication of what, uh, what it means to be uh, virile and manly and beautiful. At the same time, he's holding a uh, shivalinga on his head. Uh, so therefore conveying some image, some, some ideas about how he's simultaneously 
cool enough to have this western film grain film grain effect and aesthetic on his body and the poster but is also traditional enough uh, to be using this nice uh, to be you know carrying the shivaling down his shoulder um and you kind of see a similar thing that the chalukyas are going for with their political imagery as well um why is it that varaha is shown lifting up the earth and why is it that the chalukyas are calling themselves varaha up to this point in the deck and up to the 6th century varaha wasn't really a thing he wasn't a very popular god he was much more popular in northern india and especially in madhya pradesh the chalukyas are doing something similar to what jahangir and bahubali are doing they're saying we're taking this foreign idea and we are bringing it here and making it our own and we're using it to represent this political idea of who we are we are lifting the earth up from chaos we're saving the earth from demons just as the gods did and therefore even if we might kill a few hundred thousand of you we deserve to be taken seriously we are your rightful kings so that really adds a lot more complexity to these images and makes us makes us think makes me at least think a little more about what every single image that is in those temples is supposed to indicate um so that was the monuments aspect of it right so now let's talk a little bit about the texts that the chalukyas left behind um so these two things that you see here are um, are, are two uh, examples of chalukya inscriptions um and here what the chalukyas uh, are saying is that um one of their earliest kings pulakeshin the first Uh, was conversant with the laws of manu and the puranas and the ramayana and the mahabharata he was equal of brihaspati this great god in philosophy um, his body was purified by the by all these sacrifices and he was beloved by the entire world because he was just such so meritorious and just such a such a good and wonderful chap um that was two ways of interpreting it um nationalist historians of like uh, the 1940s 1950s would have said oh my good lord our 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 medieval kings were so wonderful why can't our modern politicians be like this they were so educated can't you see these guys were really great and they absolutely deserved uh, to rule the earth because they were so sanskari and and had read all the sacred scriptures um unfortunately there's another way that you can interpret this as well um you can see this map here i've kind of um i've kind of put those little triangles those little pyramids that i talked about um on each of the powers of medieval of early medieval india um and i've put these arrows kind of representing how all of these guys are like tied and connected to each other um and you got to think how many people in medieval india were actually literate how many people would have actually have gone to a temple and have read that inscription and the answer is really not a lot but the people who would have read them um were inevitably the most mobile the most educated people from other kingdoms um so this gives us another layer of complexity when a king makes a claim like this um it's not necessarily because they actually had that uh just like a modern politician will tell you that the gdp is growing by 500% uh, when it's actually growing by 5% um these medieval kings were also making all these outlandish claims about how brilliant and how educated they were because that was what other people expected them to say uh, because they're trying to convey a message to, to their peers and their equals um and this is the, the second inscription that you see um, in the bottom is is especially fascinating to me um because it was made by this chap called Ravi Kirti who's a he's a who's a poet um and he says that his master had six fold forces was endowed with the powers of energy mastery and good counsel um, and these are all terms that we find in the arthashastra of kautilya which some of you may have heard of one of the most famous indian strategic texts um and then he says that this king so not only did he have all these qualities that you see in this textbook that all the other kings would have known about but he dismissed his vassal kings with honor and did homage to gods and to brahmins so why is that specific thing being mentioned why why is it not mentioning for example uh, that his cowherds uh, held him in very high regard because once again it's about the elite world view to so the elites of medieval india um, claiming to have or actually having knowledge of particular texts was important therefore they claimed to know them uh, treating that equals and treating brahmins in certain ways was important therefore they claimed to have done that um and then finally that last line is the most interesting to me where ravi kirti says that um, by my poetic skill i have attained to the fame of kalidasa and bharavi uh, both these guys are famous sanskrit poets from like a north central india uh, and ravi kirti is a guy sitting in karnataka um, who whose parents probably spoke old kannada or something and here he is writing in sanskrit and saying that i am the equal of these famous sanskrit poets um if you actually did his poetry he, he really doesn't really come close but the fact that he makes this claim Uh, the fact that he chooses those particular people to compare himself to uh, is just as significant as his as him saying that his king uh, was familiar with those particular texts it says something 
about what these medieval people thought was ideal in their minds. Um, so now we talked a little bit about text. Uh, let's come back to uh, the monument. So um, these are, are two of the of my favorite temples from the period. Um, the image in the middle is of the Lokeshwara, or also known as the Virupaksha Temple in Patanakal, um, and the image on the right is the Kailashanatha Temple in Ellora. Uh, now I won't get into the architecture of these things, though I could go on about it for a while because I'm sure you guys have been studying it. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about who are the people that made them, right? So just as we early interpret that sculpture as a kind of political artifact. Let's try to see what these temples tell us about the societies that made them. Um, first of all, uh, the Lokeshwara temple, the one in the middle, um, was built, as we know, from inscriptions on the temple by this lady called Loka Mahadevi, uh, or great goddess of the earth, who was one of the most famous of the Chalukya queens. Um, she says that uh, she ordered a chap called Gundam, uh, whom she calls, she, whom she gives this amazing title of Tribhuvanacharya, the master of the three worlds, and says, oh, this guy was a genius and he made this temple for me and he was super great and all that. Um, so yeah, we know these two people, they were pretty cool, they built this temple. But what else can we infer from this temple? First of all, to build a temple like this requires money, it requires income. Um, you need to have people who are sitting and carving out big chunks of rock from the cliffs uh, near its site. You need to have people who are working those uh, big chunks into more finely grained pieces, carved pieces, uh, and kind of fit them together. You need to have designers who are deciding which particular sculpture goes where, where does it fit within the overall program of the temple. And then once the temple itself is built, um, you need to have people who are going to come and do the cooking in the temple and do the sweeping in the temple. Um, and also you need to have the Brahmins who are going to sit and conduct all the rituals that need to be maintained in that temple. Um, but what actually, survives is actually just those two names, Loka Mahadevi and Gundam. Um, we know just by pure coincidence, the name of like all these other people um, who are actually involved in carving out some of these rocks. Uh, there's a chap called Guru, one guy called Viti Marga, one guy called Koti Manchi, uh, and what might have been a woman called Dronamma. Uh, and I just find those little, those few tiny mentions of like little people just so fascinating because these are names just like ours, like they're, they're weirdly recognizable to us. Uh, I don't think any of us has a name similar to Loka Mahadevi, uh, but I'm sure a lot of us will have names similar to you know, Kuru, uh, Buru, you know, they, we might have grandmothers who have names similar to Dronama, for example. And those are the people who are actually our ancestors, though they leave almost no trace behind. Um, we can see what they made for the people who could afford to pay to leave a trace in history. Uh, and that to me is just so fascinating. Um, now, you might have noticed a little similarity between uh, this much larger temple on the right and this temple in the center. Um, and that is because this larger temple, the Kailashnatha temple, was actually based on the design of the Lokeshwara temple, uh, but is literally twice as large. So the people who built it had defeated the Chalukyas in battle. And what they're trying to say by building this temple is, hey, you remember those guys who were Chalukyas and they were super cool? Uh, we're, we're twice as awesome as they are. So you guys better give us attention. Um, and as if that wasn't enough, the Kailashnatha temple, as I'm sure a lot of you would know, um, is actually carved from a single rock. So it's this massive, massive monolithic sculpture uh, about the size of a football field. And if that's not amazing, I don't know what is. Um, and once again, if you think a little bit about how this is actually made, and if you think about the stories of the people who would have made it, uh, who are the sculptors that planned something like this? What kind of uh, logistical and managerial abilities did they have? Who are the blacksmiths who are sitting and like constantly hammering out the chisels that were needed to carve into that rock? It gives you an impression of this much, much larger and more complex society than we might otherwise think. Of. Um, so now we've gotten a little sense of like the people aside from the kings and the queens who are doing things, right? We've talked a little bit about all the architects and you know the people the carving. Um, so let's let's once again zoom out and try to think of this uh, global stage and all the interactions that are happening uh, across the world. Um, these arrows that I've drawn here uh, are to try and show you that there are also interactions happening at all layers of society, right? Um, so I talked a little bit about the guys who built uh, that uh, Kailashnatha temple. And these are among the most interesting of all medieval dynasties to me. These guys are called the Rashtrakutas. Um, and what they do, these Rashtrakutas, and they're trading with the rest of the world, right? Uh, and they want to attract merchants from the rest of the world to come and settle down in their territories and constantly be doing trade. Uh, what they do is they start to uh, uh, appoint Persians and Arabs, Muslims, uh, as the governors of their ports. So one example uh, that I've put here in the top right is of a chap called Madhumati, who was the son of uh, Sahir, ha Sahir Ahara. 
Um, clearly, these are Sanskrit depictions of the name Muhammad uh, and his father Shahriyar. Uh, and apparently, our friend Muhammad uh, made a grant to repair a monastery uh, and for the Naivedya of a goddess in a, in a temple that was under his control. Um, and that is just so interesting to me. It really flies in the face of the image that we might have of the medieval world as this kind of uh, place where everybody was just motivated primarily by religion. Um, the coin that you see on the left uh, is of the Rashtrakuta Emperor Govinda III, um, and the script is clearly inspired by some form of Arabic. Um, it's made in gold, so he can kind of trade it to people who might not really like trading in Indian copper, for example. Uh, and the fact that he's sitting on a horse is very interesting to me because horses aren't really found in India in large numbers, especially not in a quality that can be for war. So what Govinda is saying through this coin is, hey, look at me. I'm this modern world-facing guy who's going to use Arabic on his coins. I was going to get horses from the Arabs and then use it to go and conquer uh, my enemies in India. It's almost similar to, for example, a modern Indian politician saying that, hey, you know what? I'm going to get these drones from the US and I'm going to use it against my enemies on the Himalayan border. Uh, it is just so fascinating to me. Um, now, again, once again, leaving aside these kings and talking about the stories of common people, right? Um, just as you see today, uh, where a lot of us might have friends from many, many different ethnicities and religious groups, we see the exact same thing happening in the 12th century. Um, in uh, the stash of documents that are found in Cairo, uh, these belong to like a, a few generations of Jewish merchants. Um, in the 12th century, one Jewish trader uh, tells his brother-in-law who had suffered uh, a shipwreck that uh, he can seek financial assistance from his friend, uh, this Hindu chap called Timbu, um, between whom uh, they had inseparable bonds of friendship and brotherhood. Um, and that again is, is once again the sign that the medieval world is a lot more uh, like ours than we might uh, often imagine. Um, and this is by far my favorite example of any text um, from, from these merchants who lived along the coast. Um, this is of a, uh, this of a Arab merchant uh, who hasn't seen his wife in like almost 10 years uh, and writes this letter to her saying that um, if you want to divorce, um, I understand, I won't blame you, um, but, but please know that like, if you take this course of action, then we can never get back together again. And he tells his wife that uh, he, missed, he missed her so much that he used to uh, indulge in alcohol, um, but never uh, kept any slave girls or never visited any prostitutes. Um, and he says, all day long, I have a lonely heart and I am pained by our separation. And I feel that pain while writing these lines. Uh, and I'm sure every one of us has felt that, that aching emotion um, in some way or another. Um, we, and, we, and, and to me, at least I identify with that impulse, that human emotion far more than I identify with those ultra rich people who are building those temples and making all those high and mighty propaganda claims uh, that we were talking about a few minutes. Um, so once again, let's try to kind of zoom out from the little person to the big picture and try to see what's happening, right? Um, so by roughly the ninth century or so, um, this, this, this Deccan region has been connected to the world for all these centuries. Um, all these kings and queens are building their temples and they're building irrigation systems. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears throat> so, they, <clears throat> um, yeah, so they're building these irrigation systems and that's not just happening in the Deccan. The entirety of India is undergoing stuff like this, um, where because of increasing agriculture, populations are growing, people are getting richer, um, so temples are growing, cities are growing. Um, and these images that I've kept in the bottom, uh, in the center and in the right, are from um, the from dynasties in Madhya Pradesh and in, uh, and in Bengal. And once again, if you think about what was actually involved in building these temples, um, you have to imagine that um, these, these are really complex and very sophisticated societies. Uh, and over the course of the uh, ninth and 10th centuries, actually, all of these big regions that you see highlighted in the map all go to war with each other. And the war is something that we're, we're kind of used to thinking about, you know, <clears throat> I don't know what is up for my voice, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> <clears throat> Um, so war is something we used to think of in like a Bollywoodized sense, right? you know, this king 
you know, just has this big army and he just goes wherever he wants and he just kills a whole bunch of people and he comes back. Um, but war is really not that simple. War is a very sophisticated logistical operation. It requires a lot of financial resources to undertake. Uh, we saw Govinda, for example, is like importing these horses literally from thousands of miles away to conduct his wars. And um, once again, this kind of tells you that um, all these activities that you see when you see kings boasting about wars or boasting about building temples um, are just the tip of an iceberg uh, when a lot, a lot more stuff was actually happening at the time. Um, one really great way to try and see this increasing social complexity to my mind um, is to see how temple designs grow more and more complex. Um, so if you look at the temples that you see uh, in the extreme left here, they're very simple, right? Um, but what happens over the centuries is that these same little modules are kind of repeated again and again in these fractal patterns to create increasingly large and imposing structures which require more and more people to actually design and build them. Um, and this once again is a sign of, of a great deal of social and economic complexity. Um, the temple that you see in the middle is an image of the famous temple of Belur. I don't know how many folks here have actually been to Belur, uh, but those who have would know that Belur doesn't have uh, this dome on top of the temple yet. Um, but this is a picture from the 19th century or so, and this dome is just so fascinating to me uh, because if, if, if any of you are um, from North India or from Madhya Pradesh, you might recognize this as a temple style from there. Um, so the fact that this temple style is showing up so far south in Karnataka, once again tells us that India's regions aren't just connected to the rest of the world, they're also connected to each other and they're learning and taking and interacting styles from each other, just as we do today, uh, where, you know, uh, you might find somebody in North India sing, singing uh, a, a song from a, a really funny Tollywood movie, for example, uh, just, just as we, just we see that happening, we see some chaps from South India in the 12th century building a temple using a North Indian temple design. Um, and um, what else really survives from the cities that these people were building? Um, the image that you see um, on the left is of uh, a manuscript from uh, the Pala period Bengal. Um, and I just really love this manuscript because um, you have to imagine that the guy who made it was used to seeing altars that were shaped uh, like what is painted here. Uh, and was used to thinking of his gods. Perhaps he dreamed of gods that looked like this. Um, and the calligraphy is so beautiful. You never really think of Indians as doing calligraphy, but you can you can really imagine how they would have uh, dipped this uh, little stylus into some black ink and from these very careful uh, geometric designs. Um, and we see this explosion of literature that I talked about in the very beginning. And not all this literature survives, but some of this literature tells us about how these cities were designed. They describe uh, these geometric shapes, these axes that were used to kind of divide the city, how people were put in like particular parts of the city, depending on what caste, what occupation they had. Um, and weirdly enough, in some medieval cities that still survive today, uh, such as Warangal, for example, we still see signs of this amazing geometrical orientation. Uh, this image that you see here um, in the top right corner is of Warangal. And you can see that it's created there's this beautiful two concentric circles. And all the gates that were there in Warangal were positioned exactly along the concept, along the, uh, the axes of geometry of this thing. So clearly um, this idea of like geometric uh, organization of temples was also being applied to cities as well. But because a lot of these medieval cities continue to be cities today, we can't really see that city planning and the original design that we used to have. Um, so now I've gone on and on about the Deccan and I haven't really talked about uh, our beautiful Chinese goddess and how she happened to end up there. Um, and so to tell the story, I have to tell you a little bit about arguably one of the most famous South Indian polities, uh, namely the Cholas. I'm sure a lot of us have heard of them. Um, and all these processes I was describing, you know, of increasing agriculture and growing populations and growing cities uh, are all happening all across India at the time, especially they're happening in the Tamil country. Uh, but in the Tamil country, you have like a whole bunch of different kings who aren't able to uh, overcome each other until one really extraordinary chap shows up at, in, the, uh, in the early 11th century, a chap called Raja Raja Chora. And what Raja Raja does is he manages to defeat all the other Tamil kings and make this new polity. Um, and the kind of resources this new polity was able to mobilize can be seen in the Brihadishwara temple, uh, which you see here on the right, and which I began this presentation with. Uh, the very first slide was of the Brihadishwara temple. Um, and this is a really gigantic monument, right? Just, just for a sense of scale, look how tiny people are in comparison to this enormous thing. Um, and think a little bit about how the hell they made something like this. Um, the rock is, is not sandstone, it's granite. It's a very, very hard rock. 
um, you have to think about thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of people who are quarrying that stone, moving that stone, designing this. Um, there would have had to be some kind of remarkable technological innovations to build something on a scale like this. You need to have um, perhaps some kind of wooden ramps. You need to have uh, these massive teams of elephants that are like pulling um, pulling these uh, bits of rock higher and higher and kind of fitting them all together. Um, and the kind of endowments that were made to the temple, once again, um, show you just how uh, globalized uh, even these temples actually were because Raja Raja Chola made it a point to endow this temple uh, with stuff from Sri Lanka, for example, or Karnataka to deliberately show that, look, I control things so far away that I can actually spend stuff from there in my temple here in Tanjo. Um, but that that actually brings up uh, a somewhat more uh, disturbing question about medieval India. I was talking a little bit about how um, these merchants kind of give you a sense of just how nice and, and just how human a lot of these medieval people were. Um, but the Cholas give us examples of just how cruel uh, they could be to each other as well. Um, in this verse 53 that you see on the left here, um, Rajendra Chola, who was Raja Raja's son, uh, describes how he destroyed one of the famous cities of the Deccan called Maniketa. Uh, and he says that uh, while that great city was burning amongst thousands of flames thrown by his army, uh, the women who were moving in the open spaces of high palatial residences uh, appeared uh, in the middle of the smoke like lightning moving through clouds. Um, and that is just so messed up. Um, you have to imagine that his army was actually there, uh, that they had barricaded these women inside their mansions and set them on fire um, and found it amusing uh, to see the kind of pain that they were that they were going through and kind of use that as part of Rajendra's propaganda later on. Um, and just the way that this man is described in a later verse, he says, um, the hero in the midst of the cavalry, the illustrious Rajendra, pleasing to the eyes and minds of the people and resplendent um, displaying Vida Krida. So he was, he was almost sporting with the remains of that of that city. He was parading them uh, in this great parade where he was riding horses surrounded by all these young men. Uh, and he says that he had uh, fulfilled his father's vow. Um, and, and that to me, again, kind of, kind of shows me how complex uh, medieval India actually was. Um, while you have these glimpses of the humanity and relatability of these people uh, that we can identify with, we also see the same kind of horrific atrocities in war uh, that are still being committed today in, for example, the Middle East or India. And that are still being used more importantly by politicians to justify their credentials and, 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 their, and their success. Um, so up to this point, I, um, we've been talking a lot about kings. Um, I'd just like to kind of conclude with um, with another piece of this puzzle, which kind of tries to tell us how our Indian goddess ended up in China. Um, now, sometime around the early 11th century, a bunch of Tamil merchants um, ended up in uh, the city of Kaifeng, uh, which was the capital of the ruling dynasty of China. Um, and the Chinese tell us a little bit about uh, what these merchants actually gave them. And it's pretty interesting to me. Uh, so these merchants apparently presented one robe and a cap adorned with pearls. 21,000 ounces of pearls, 60 elephant tusks, 60 catties of frankincense, jade, glass, and cotton fabrics. Um, and that this was all a gift that was given by Rajendra Chola to the Chinese emperor. And then the merchants themselves, all by themselves, presented 6,600 ounces of pearls and 3,300 catties of aromatic drugs. Why is this so interesting? Um, first of all, the fact that um, Rajendra Chola, who is sitting in Tamil Nadu, is presenting frankincense to the Chinese emperor. Frankincense is not found in India. It's something that's grown in Arabia. So our man had imported all the way from Arabia in order to present it to the Chinese emperor. Um, second, the fact that the merchants themselves are making a gift to the emperor is very significant uh, because clearly they're here to do business on their own account with the Chinese. Um, and I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with the famous uh, expedition that Rajendra Chola made to Southeast Asia. Um, a lot of textbooks say that uh, he conquered it and it was part of the Chola empire and all that. That's really an overstatement, but clearly what the Cholas did was actually open trade routes from India to China by going and conquering Southeast Asia. Um, so you see this red line that is there is basically a trade route. Um, and what the Cholas did by invading um, Southeast Asia uh, perhaps because of the influence of merchants who told them, hey, you know, we can make a lot of money if we do this, uh, is the Cholas opened up trade uh, all the way to China. 
um, and as a result of that, you see um, Indian merchants starting to in appear in increasing numbers in Southeast Asia and gradually appearing in large numbers in China as well. So over centuries, uh, what these merchants do is they settle down, they actually intermarry. So you can imagine that at some point in perhaps uh, the 13th century, um, you would have seen people living in Guangdong who had both Tamil and like Chinese features uh, and who spoke perhaps a hodgepodge uh, of like Cantonese uh, and Tamil, which is just so interesting. And there was these guys uh, who were sitting there who uh, had this, this memory of this goddess that their grandfathers used to worship um, and who knew how to explain this to like Chinese sculptors and who had the connections they needed to uh, get the Chinese government to let them build a temple and who built this temple perhaps as a community center, perhaps uh, like those Chalukya kings were in to make a statement about their identity uh, in relation to the other people they were interacting with and finally uh, gave us uh, this beautiful sculpture that we started um, our story with. Um, so what, what, are, what are our takeaways from this? Right? So um, through all this, I hope you've come to realize that medieval India is exponentially more complex and interesting than we imagine. Um, and we have to be very careful when we interpret historical evidence to build a narrative. Um, because um, to just fall for everything that medieval people are telling us is basically to accept everything uh, that a modern advertiser or a modern politician would tell us. So you have to be careful in interpreting evidence um, and try to understand who is the audience that this narrative is meant to tell a story to. It's not usually us, it's usually somebody who lived back then. So what was the mind of these people and why would they have chosen to use that particular image? Um, and finally, um, if you keep all this in mind, and if you actually interpret historical evidence correctly, um, the story that emerges is of a past that is a distant echo of our own. That's surprisingly similar to our own. It's the same kind of complexity, the same kind of innovations, uh, the same kind of joy and wonder and creativity, um, and also the same preventable suffering and same kind of um, merciless inequalities that we're used to seeing in our own world today. Um, so with that, I will stop my presentation and um, I hope to have some questions so we can have a bit of a discussion about all this. Okay, uh, there are two questions we have uh, uh, that uh, students put in while you were talking. One is from Rashi. She's asking, in Jahangir's painting, what does the whale and bull signify? Um, so I'm not an really expert in Mughal art, so I might I might not know the exact answer. But um, my feeling is that the whale might represent like a legend of like uh, a whale that carries the earth on its back. Uh, the bull might represent maybe something similar, something that carries the world on its back, or perhaps meant to represent the strong and powerful animal uh, that Jahangir wished to identify himself with. Okay, and the second question is, uh, Trisha wants to know which text is this verse about Rajendra from? Okay, I don't remember which one, but another. Uh, you, I'm, I'm assuming is the one uh, about Manikata. So those are from something called the Karandai uh, copper plates, which were found in one of his temples. Anything you can find it on archive.org. Um, I can just look up the spelling. Just give me a couple of minutes and I'll put it in the chat. Um, and you can look it up uh, when you get the time. Okay, uh, Trisha also wants to know why medieval India and why the Deccan specifically and what inspired you to choose this period and this location for your book? Well, um, part of it comes from the, the way that we the way that we study history in our textbooks. Like I'm sure all of us has read the Mauryan Empire and then there's like this huge gap and then we study the Gupta Empire and then there's this huge gap and then we study the Delhi Sultanate and then there's this huge gap and then we study the Mughals, right? Um, so it's all a very kind of North India centric narrative and this is a huge chunks of like hundreds of years which are just not mentioned at all. Uh, so imagine like telling the history of Europe by like starting with the Greeks and then going to the Romans uh, and then like jumping to uh, Leonardo da Vinci um, and then like jumping to uh, Garibaldi and then like ending the discussion there and saying this is where history ends. You know? um, how can you tell the history of India without telling the history of all of its regions? How can you tell the history of Europe without talking about the history of Germany? You got to talk about the Deccan. The Deccan is one of the most important geopolitical regions of India. And the medieval period is really when a lot of the things that we most identify with being Indian start to emerge. Uh, so pilgrimage sites, for example, 
uh, temples popping up all across the country, uh, different forms of gods, uh, different kinds of worship, especially the idea of like uh, repeating mantras, the idea of going and doing darshan before a god, um, the idea of like uh, taking mass bathings in, in like a large river and all that. These are all things that start in medieval India. But somehow we have no conception of how all the things that we see around us today um, and most identify with being Indian originate in a period that we don't study at all. Um, and especially a region that we never hear about at all. So my whole idea was to try and shed light uh, on this really fascinating period, this really fascinating place. Um, okay, the next question from uh, Rinjan. Uh, since there are a lot of poems and stories written about the glory of the kings, can some of them also be interpreted as satires? So, I mean, it kind of depends on the context. In some places, yes, um, but in most places, no. So um, you have to think about where these stories are found, right? So um, a king is going to build a temple, spend a whole lot of money. He's not going to write a satire out himself on the walls of a temple that he has built, right? Um, but in some cases, um, you, you see like poets, for example, poets, um, sometimes these poets are also kings. So there's a really interesting king called Mahendra Varman, uh, of the Pallava dynasty of, of, um, of Kanchipuram. Uh, and this guy writes something called the Mattavilasa Prahasana, uh, which is which basically means uh, the farce of the drunkard's games. Uh, and the entire story is about this, this Shaiva ascetic who has lost his uh, his skull, which he used to like collect meat and like booze in. Uh, and, and like, he's just going around like fighting with everybody saying, where the hell is my skull? Who stole my skull? Um, and like saying that oh, the, the king has no idea how to, how to do his business. The judges are all corrupt and that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I'm not sure if like um, satire was a genre the way that we think about it. I think it's it's a lot more subtle um, and most tragically, right? Because the most of the people who are literate at the time tended to be kings or people who whose salaries were paid by kings. Uh, you can imagine that anybody who was stupid enough to write a, a famous satire about a king would not survive for very long, uh, and his text definitely would not survive for very long. So it must have happened. I, I imagine that there was graffiti um, in some of these cities saying, you know, uh, th this king's breath smells like poo and stuff like that. But like none of that has survived. <laughs> we have no idea uh, what exactly what forms it might take. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, Ketki is asking, in the beginning you mentioned that wars took place for the water resources uh, along um, Tunga Bhadra River in Karnataka. So between which dynasties were the wars fought? So very often it didn't even happen between dynasties. Like if you look at like inscriptions from the medieval Deccan, like villages are fighting war with each other over, over water resources. So you'll find like an inscription saying, you know, uh, um, Kateyamma, who was the son of the blacksmith, uh, died defending the village's lake uh, from people of this, that, and the other village. Um, so, like, you know, kings were doing their own stuff in the towns and in the cities, uh, and the people of the villages were kind of left to themselves. And they very often, like, um, it was it was like a do or die situation. You had to get water, uh, and if the other person died, you don't care. You had to get cows, and the other person died, you don't really care. Um, but it also happens at a much, much larger scale. Um, so you talked about the Tungabhadra River, right? So um, the the area between the Krishna and Tungabhadra River, the Raichur Duab, is actually one of the most important geopolitical uh, areas in all of India because you see wars being fought in the Cholas and Chalukyas for control of the Raichur Duab in roughly the 11th century, and then 500 years later, Vijayanagara and the Deccan Sultanates are still fighting wars over that exact same territory, um, and like. Though there's a tendency to say that, oh yeah, Vijayanagara Hindu Empire was fighting Muslim states. Um, why are they doing the same thing that Cholas and Chalukyas are doing? Because of geopolitics. Controlling this rich, fertile land and extracting taxes from it was something that any kingdom, no matter what religion they followed, um, was interested in doing. What that answers you can. Uh, and from one anecdote to another, are there any good books that cover an aspect of Deccan history? I think someone wants a reading list. <laughs> um, so I, I would say, wait for my book. Uh, but, if, but if you're impatient, um, then I would definitely say, take a look at um, uh, G. Yazdani's Early History of the Deccan. Um, but, but be very careful, like take, take it with a pinch of salt. Um, because it, it suffers from the same problem I was telling, telling you about earlier, right? Where you take what the kings are saying literally, and you just talk about the kings and say, oh, this king was very great. And then this other king was also great. 
and that king was great and and all kings were so great and our history is so great and glorious in wars i mean the common people were all in support of wars and women were treated wonderfully or like <laughs> one interesting thing about yazdani's book is that when they when uh, the writers deign to talk about women they only talk about them in one sub chapter about society um, and there's like two paragraphs about oh, this queen did this and that queen did this so we can assume that all women did wonderfully in this period so just take it all with a pinch of salt okay and uh, i think this this we should probably have this is the last question for now i think we're over our time uh, this is from riddhi who wants to know what was the condition of sculptors who made the temples um, i'm not sure which temple uh, she's talking about but uh, so um that that's an interesting question and the answer is kind of complicated um we know that like broadly a lot of these sculptors were organized into guilds uh, and these guilds actually some of them had their own like kind of unique logos um, and would actually move from one kingdom to another in search of work um but we can imagine that the guys who were in charge you know that their equivalents of ceos and ceos um those are the guys whose names survive and who who are actually carved into temples and would have got the best salaries um but all the other guys you know um the the apprentices the master sculptors probably did okay but what about the people who are like doing the cooking the people who are um doing the carving uh, of all the big chunks of rock and all that and like frankly speaking it's difficult to imagine that they would have had very good lives especially if we look at the condition of uh, manual laborers in india today or even india in the british period right so um that probably wasn't great but as i said we don't really have a lot of evidence so we can't totally no uh, but here's a little here's a interesting fact to it um, i mentioned a whole bunch of names you know buru and biti marga and all those people um, so these actually survive from a sandstone mine uh, which was near the old chalukya towns and um, they they would carve their name and put a little dot next to it and that might have been to show how many hours or how many days in the week they had worked for and perhaps the salaries uh, would be calculated on the basis of that um and we can imagine the salaries probably won't have been in cash because cash wasn't as important to the economy then as it is now which might sound a bit surprising but not everybody had a pocket full of coins uh, most people would have been paid in like food uh, or accommodation so how much rice how much grain would you have gotten would have depended on how much work you did okay uh, they just wants to know what caused certain groups of farmers to move up the rank and end up as kings what was the differentiating factor uh, well the answer to that is quite simple and that is uh, being better at killing other farmers than, than the rest of them were good. i mean it's it's all down to war uh, a, a lot of um uh, the this concentration of resources in one region as compared to all other regions uh, usually happens as a result of force um and so that's kind of the that, that's the sad answer like if, if better generals and there's a reason why very often kings found it so important to boast uh, about their military achievements um because being able to go to war and like a uh, seize uh, wealth from other people uh, was absolutely integral uh, to to royal power in the medieval period um Okay. Uh, this is the last question, Anirudh. Do you have time for one more? Okay. Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, I, have, I have time to talk again. This, this is my favorite. <laughs> okay. Uh, how did they decide the engravings uh, that were made on the temples? Riddhi wants to know. Um, once again, a good question, and there's 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 a there's a lot of motivations that would have gone into it. Very often, it's just about wanting to say a particular thing about yourself, right? Um, and the reasons why they would have said those particular things at those particular time can only be guessed at uh, i'll give you one example so we talked about the lokeshwara the lokeshwara temple which is queen built um so her her stepson became the king after she died um and he he in this inscription he talks about uh, homage to the union of shiva and gauri um in which the 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 breasts of the goddess are passionately kissed by the left arm of the god um and then he compares that to his mother and his stepmother and his father making love and that is that is so weird but but why would he choose 50 or so uh, the same year that uh, he's losing a war that he's fighting with neighbors to his north 
So perhaps uh, by, by making that particular inscription, by choosing to remind people of his mother and father, he's trying to say, hey, remember how strong and how famous and how much you guys loved my parents? Please have faith in me as well as I do something like that. Uh, so that's one of the few cases where we can actually make that kind of inference. In most cases, we have almost no idea of like what was the actual context within which those particular engravings were made. But broadly, we can say, you know, they're trying to show off, they're trying to appeal to a particular kind of audience. Okay, and uh, Vinayan wants to know, how do you filter out and flesh a narrative from stray evidences to final book? That's a process question. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very profound question. Um, so broadly, what I was aiming to do with this book is to try and build a, a narrative of what happened in the medieval Deccan, but also to give people an insight into the minds of these medieval Deccan kings and help, help people understand why did they do what they did? Instead of just giving you this list of, of one damn thing after another, why were these things done? How are they all kind of related to each other? Um, and the way to filter out that narrative, I mean, there's, there's two ways to do it. One way that I went about it was um, looking at the story I wanted to tell and then seeing what evidences were rele relevant to that. So uh, the first draft of my book was about 140,000 words because I just like wrote everything I could find and just threw it into that book. But then in a later round, I was like, okay, so the theme I want to talk about is about inside the minds of these kings. So what image, what, what events, what particular actions uh, will give my reader the best sense of those particular things? And then kind of narrowing out the stuff that best portrays that and like ignoring the stuff that doesn't. And that's one way that I did it. Um, I also had like a whole bunch of stuff talking about, you know, and this sculpture is so cool because you just look at just look at the way that the artist made it and this is so amazing. But then I kind of realized it isn't relevant to like the overall theme. Um, so I had to get rid of it. So broadly, you get all the evidence you want together um, and then you kind of like choose a theme and you choose a narrative and you kind of narrow down from there. That's broadly the thing that I did. Okay, uh, I think that's all the time we have for, for this talk. Anirudh, thank you so much. That was incredible from the goddess in Guangdong to medieval divorces to war. It was like so fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for coming thank and talking to us. My pleasure. Um, uh, okay, so a few other note of, uh, you know, thank yous. Uh, thank you to our Dean Samir Shah, our program chair, Kathy, and the CFC team. Uh, thanks also, also to Juvika who organized this, um, the set IT desk, uh, especially Himan Bhai who helped us with all the tech stuff. And uh, thank you guys, awesome questions, awesome audience. It is, it was great fun. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you, thank you. And um, uh, Diana, if it's okay, I mean, you can you can share my contact details like an email ID or something with the students. So if anybody has a burning question that I wasn't able to answer, then by all means, please get in touch. I love talking to the young folks about history and like trying to get people to understand better. So by all means. Um, that is that started. that's great, Anirudh. Thank you so much. I will share your contact details with them, and you know, you'll probably be flooded with emails. But <laughs> you asked for okay. it, so. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you. All. Okay. See you. Thanks, Enjoy guys. Your bye, bye. Bye. Bye.